title here, Key to Everything, and many other words after it. Like Four level, conformal, scale invariant, complex, Riemann oh, net split, least cosmological, unit manifold. Right. Yeah, because he has a special place, and then uh, Ricardo at the end. Um, and this is again in the coins and some of the stuff in Rome, and here you see uh, the team. <laughs> now, some of you know who know me well know that besides being a theoretical physicist, I'm a high priest, and I've spent uh, I'm a life at learning transcendence. So I've tried for years to get Peter Lou with the team to they won't pay a, pay a bit of attention to my model because it's way outside the box and they think I'm a loony anyway. So, so I say, so God, you know, God or the, or the Ayunian poly synchronicity is trying to help. I told it to Peter a couple of days ago, you know, that God is helping. He goes, ha! <laughs> so there's still, she forgets, of course, you're going to forget that. So there's still a gap between, I need, I need these, I need the team to, I can't do the math alone, which uh, I'll get to in one of the next uh, little bits. So then I'm going to go, that's all for that one, okay, go away, um, to the main, uh, first of all, I probably should apologize that, um, so I show from the beginning, that uh, my, this talk is somewhat conceptual and axiomatic, so you'll have to bear with me on that. So this, this... You got an abstract of the title. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Which was shorter. <laughs> Probably, uh, anyway, um, I'm, a, I'm one of the few of the opinion that, uh, you know, since the time of Galileo, you know that uh, Religious leaders were pretty much morons, and you know they wanted to kill Co God, Galileo and Copernicus waited until his deathbed. So there's been a rift between science and theology for hundreds of years. But uh, epistemologically, especially with completing the tools of epistemology, they're really opposite ends of the long spectrum. Transcendence doesn't take away from empiricism; it just makes it quicker and easier. I remember, for example, a long time ago, I was some of the greatest philosophers of the age. 
at a conference and they sat around a little room at the size of this. I'll do this one for the rest of my life. I'll do this one like the spokes of the wheel. So it transcends, you can say, well, the answer's over here and get there quicker. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read that. Um, so I've been for the last 20 years or more developing a new anthropic cosmology which exists mostly in third regime physics, classical quantum, the next regime, which is imminent in his unified field mechanics over Einstein's unified field will um, reside. Um, so I've, no, I've been starting to notice that there's some conformal scale and varying properties to, I have a least cosmological unit, which resides, a, rest, part of it rests in uh, quantum space and the other part of it rests in the brain world in M theory and, it, and it's a part of a gating mechanism. So, but I think it was what April, I forget when Easter was, I woke up three o'clock in the morning and I'd been telling my friends of beings <coughs> from the opposite side of the earth. And then um, when I woke up at 3 a.m. I had a little antipode just occurred to me. Just, and then I found out Google, Google is a Google app with the antipode. And that got me thinking. Um, so the lowest, and I'm not going to go into this, uh, spend any time on it. I've been lecturing various groups, not all of you know about it, but you can, you can go on the three archives, research gate, academia.edu, or the reverse picture, and I have, I have dozens of papers that you can see my, my attempt at this least cosmological unit, which, um, that's a very rough conceptual drawing, and it's tessellating. If you stare at that, it's like the ambiguous cubes, and you can see that it oscillates not only within each little hexagon, but larger and smaller sizes, too. I have a, the unex Expanded noetic field equation is very simple. It's almost like Newton's F equals ma, but you can make it as complex as, as you want. And we will see in a minute when we get into some of the topology that that you know it, it, it reverses over crossings, under crossings, and from field to you know wave part of duality thing. So the second level is I found, and I'm not going to go into this, but conf uh, our Russian colleagues may have been looking into the conformal changes in molecules and things, so there's a similar structure to this least cosmological unit in, in cellular, uh, cellular conformations. Recently, I wrote a paper on, on love, and so that would be the next level to the observer. And I found the same structure with uh, this unit. That, um, I'm a Cartesian dualist, by the way. This, none of this works in the, in the uh, cognitive model of my equals brain. Yeah, this, this is all about an anthropic cosmology. So um, I noted, you know, so I, I wrote a paper, a, a spiritual basis for a physical cosmology of spiritual union. And it, it tells some about the structure and how. You know, it's almost like a little laser when you get to a certain point where you like each other enough, I'll, I'll, kind of the mirrors align automatically and then love is a, kind of like a laser uh, super radiant. You can also get this online either from the journal, Journal of Consciousness, Exploration and Research or on the Victor Archive. So, uh, 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 well, I, I would uh, uh, think of, uh, of that, just uh, the Riemann. Uh, structure. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. I'm probably not going to take questions till the end because okay. I hope to even quit early. Um, so, and this was the fun. This was the funny one, which um, you know, I, I I I kind of accepted a little bit of the Gaia principle because uh, my my first degree was in clinical psychology, so I'm. I was partial to the Jungian collective unconscious being physically real. And these, and the best evidence for that was like you get a, an idiot savant who's been like an Appalachia and isolated from the whole world with no education, and he can recite the weather for a hundred year period perfectly, like it's in the almanac. You know, so there is some, uh, and I also wrote a paper that's in press, the uh, origin of sexual preference. It's not genetic. It's not psychi psychiatric. It's a it's a Carti has a Cartesian element, and I model that after every 250,000 years the geo the North and South Pole reverse because of solar wind 
in flares. If you have two mentally ill or one mentally ill parents, there's a time early on in embryonic development where the force can reverse the enema and enema. So that's a, another story that you can look into later if you're interested. So there is quite a bit of evidence for Pangaea. Uh, this one shows a little bit about how the continents are skinned together and separated and the Bible suggests they're going to come back together. So I, I looked for evidence of that because, um, and I found out that um, India, I think, is the fastest, about half a foot a year. Australia, a couple of inches, and the rest of them are only going hundreds of an inch. So I thought maybe I, you could watch and see, you know, if a Judeo-Christian millennium is going to start, are they going to slow down and reverse, you know, something like that. But the thing, the obvious thing is that that, that you probably didn't realize you, the GPS satellites have to be constantly updated because of continental drift. That's just kind of a curious little footnote. Um, so if you look at the Google app for um, for the antipode of the temple in Israel, it's on one side of Australia. Um, Mormon doctrine is another temple, so there's two, and it's in the U.S. and the, on the other side of Australia. And that's not very, there's not, few, there's very, only a few hints of that in the, in the scriptures. So then I just said, well, I'll think the center of Australia, where is that antipode? And it's in the, you can see where it is in the ocean. So the suggestion is, if you look at the, um, you can't see it easily from this diagram, but what's going to happen is those, those two antipodes of the temple in Jerusalem and the temple in Adam on the Island in, in the Americas, and I was dumbfounded, that's a very obscure word in Adam on the Island, but it was in the Google uh, app, they will, they will be together at the same point. And this, this in a sense is where the Riemann, the least cosmological unit is really a higher dimensional Riemann sphere, you know, the zero point, the infinity point, and part of the gate that opens. It has to be closed or in time for us. If it was full open, we wouldn't abide time. We, God is right here, and so like the lighthouse flashing, the gate opens like this. This gate is locked by the uncertainty principle. So the whole thing of designing all this is to surmount the uncertainty principle, have access to the next regime. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm just going to skip over some of these things. So the second piece of evidence is the fossil records. And they found extensive evidence if you match the fossils back together into a Pangaea, uh, you know, it, that works pretty well. Um, then also besides fossils in the rocks, and they found also glacial, glacial uh, things. Uh, evidence too in, in the. I'm going to write up a paper probably for the, one of these that journals, so eventually this will be available. And then the final one, and and this this almost this conformal scale invariant structure to the least unit in the Riemann sphere structure that you know God is the great physicist, so somehow it gives God power when all those things line up. It's just kind of to me it's miraculous. But Einstein said, if you look far enough out into space, you see the back of your head, but I never, I didn't think Einstein was into a wraparound cosmology. The Planck satellite has not ruled out wraparound cosmology, but it's not, it wasn't set for it. So if in 10 years they reset it, we'll find a wraparound cosmology, but it will be very subtle. Like one, instead of, instead of one, it will be like 1.1, 1 .1, or just, just the bare minimum to have a wraparound cosmology. This wraparound cosmology is generally the dodec dodecahedral de sitter anti de sitter phase, space. The thing that I like about this dark matter, and it maybe overlaps with Peter's, but dark matter and dark energy are just the rest of the multiverse. We have a finite closed Hubble sphere that we're in in time. The rest of the multiverse, like grains of sand at the seashore, are an infinite, nester, infinite number of nested Hubble spheres, each with their own fine tuned laws of physics. All of that, because it's almost totally causally separated, but not fully, so that's why all of that huge infinite mass only has a small effect on, on our cosmological constant. So the cosmological constant 
fluctuates around zero, the same thing as, in, as the Planck constant. String theorists threw, threw out the original hadronic form of string theory because it had a tachyon, and it also had a variable string tension, which in the model I used for this, I bring those back in, because they had ignored Bohm and Kramer, and De Broglie and Kramer is a standing wave of the future past. <coughs> if you think of that as a one-dimensional standing wave, that's absurd and you know, it seems silly, but hyperspherical standing wave. So you get, you have a virtual tardon tachyon interaction as part of that. And I guess I won't really say much about the Riemann sphere, but part of this whole kind of formal scalar invariant thing is, is a Riemann manifold, which helps, helps um, the way the thing operates. We're going to go now to explain some more of this in a different way. Show from the beginning, and um, so this is a, a standard uh, conceptual model of our our, our four-dimensional reality, Minkowski-Riemann space, emerging from a lesser-dimensional space-time, and especially this is kind of geared towards the observer. We you know, you shine a, li a light through a two-dimensional hologram to get a three-dimensional image. You know, we don't, we haven't done it anywhere near enough work of the, on that. So here's, um, I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but there's the, um, this is our view of reality on the left here, right now, the current view. And um, another, there, there's been, it's from the first, 90 second advertisement for SBQR. The logo of my hotel in um, Kuala Lumpur, that's what it was, and it just, but there's been dozens of these synchronicities. So I think eventually we'll write a paper on Pauli Jung synchronicity. But the one on the right is more what we're in this um, virtual reality for our minds as observers in three space. Thank you, Anton. So we get something that looks like that. Um, so on, this is our view of reality now. Each, the locus of points or a line element, is the quant quantum mechanics is the basement of reality. This is the stochastic quantum foam, and it's experimentally verified by the uncertainty principle. So the first thing is to do something else. Physicists have ignored the direct polarized vacuum because they think it conflicts with gauge theory. That's nonsense. It doesn't, and you can find rigorous proofs of that. Um, the best evidence, which almost demand the existence of a direct polarized vacuum, is the Casimir effect. Lesser can't really exist without a direct polarized vacuum. Lesser are the Zeeman and um, Heron Bohm effects. So this this would mean, again, metaphor. This I did this because I was kind of teasing uh, uh, Peter about uh, quaternions in his space, anti-space. So then, hidden in this is there's a beat frequency, space between the basement of reality and there's a gate. We're going to design a gating mechanism into third regime reality. Uh, another metaphor. So the whole thing is, this is, this is our uh, fermion vertex, our zero-dimensional singularity. Fake, virtual, we need to have a higher-dimensional brain world structure, and it's easy to do the first level up, but this, this should have more, this should have more of these brain worlds. So there's a, the other thing is string, string theory is looking for one unique compactification to create the standard model. In this model, there's a continuous state compactification, 12, 11, then down, it gets down near virtual Planck, it never approaches Planck, and the Riemann sphere flips and it starts over again. And part of that is the handshaking of these brains. Um, this is kind of Kramer like, the present as a steady wave of the future past in complex eight space, but you really need a, a, com a more complexity to that. I just want to give you a taste of the flavor. You can go and find find these things to study. It's like you know, if you 
read the latest paper on on Indian quantum computing, you know, it takes a week to read it. So, you know, I can only do what I can do. So again, traditional atom, neutron protein, the quarks. This is the cut into third regime. And as Peter, find Peter's uh, paper in our last proceedings <coughs> on dimensionality, it uh, talks about how beautifully three, three is such an important number. So I, this is a collab Yao manifold. And I'm showing the, this is the three space line element in between with the brain elements behind where I'm slowly building up to figure how, how do these things transform. <coughs> and I started to, to design an ontological phase topological field theory. It's a step between a past quantum field theory and quant topological quantum field theory. So here's another, another look at this. Here's our zero dimensional point particle. Lou calls this a shadow. In three space, we don't see any of this because of the uncertainty principle, but this is really a, a mere symmetric structure of overcrossings and undercrossings. I mean, this is the first level up. This is, I guess, only an XY, but you need more. Um, again, another metaphor for this. Here is the three space line element. Hidden is the high dimensional brain structure. That uh, you the unified mechanical object which builds this up. If you get anything out of this lecture, no longer think of a proton or something as a three-dimensional object in the Euclidean or space or Minkowski space. If you're if you're not if you want to get a leadership position and you want to get prepared for the next regime, you must start thinking about matter. And string theory hints at that already, but they don't go very far into it. So. The barrier, the barrier from quantum mechanical uncertainty into segue, um, virtually every physicist says because we don't see the Kaluza Klein in the additional dimensions that curl up the Planck scale. Not the only interpretation. Subtracted interferometry, you can have infinite size extra dimensions like Randall Sundrum and lesser like Lisa's are infinite. Nema of Carney Hamlets are a millimeter. So Euclidean space, this is the manifold that you need to get through. And so the experiment, which I'm going to end with, all spectroscopy is done in three space. Vichier postulated tight bound states in hydrogen below the lowest Bohr orbit. Sounds like nonsense. But if there are high dimensions, and this cycles with this V3 frequency, like I said, here's the three space. And this cavity has to open to let the life principle, the unified field, come in and, and run things in a de broglie bohm sense. Then you open the first one with a resonant hierarchy, and you get a another spectral lineup. The first hydrogen spectral line is half angstrom, the second is two. So, and you can use the standard formulas. I haven't bothered to do that yet. So let's say 0 0.7, 1 1.1, and 1.8. And I'm, I, I'm guessing, and I haven't quite figured that out, I think because of the mirror symmetry, there's not five, there's only two. And then when you excite a hydrogen electron enough, it blows off to infinity. So when we finally get fully into unified field mechanics, the signal won't come back. But the experiment in this National Institute of Standards and Technology in Washington, D.C. has all the equipment, trying to get my buddies to help me write up that experiment. Um, so you find that here's the standard spectral line, you find the next spectral line and the next one, and then theoretically the third one, the signal won't come back and it will blow off to infinity. Just two, just two images of, of the same thing. You know, surrounded by this manifold of uncertainty. It's somewhat chaotic from appearance if you're looking at it quantum mechanically, but it's highly ordered in, to a certain degree in, in another way by phases. Um, this is the best diagram I could figure out so far. Instead of, I have some with this where these are closed. This is open, so it's a written string vertex. And you can see it has the ability to rotate. You need these rotations in order to manipulate the structure, kind of like Lou hinted at the end of his talk yesterday with the topological moves. 
These are field lines, you know, like de broglie bohms super quantum potential field lines that manipulate the rotations of this, um, and, you know, blah, 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 and the other one. So, this, the tessellation of space-time can be, look, metaphorically, look something like this. This has enough degrees of freedom if you followed uh, the description in the, Tom Toffoli in a, in a book, uh, 1996, um, FISCOM 96, in, where we talked about using electromagnetics had been not been used much at that time towards building a quantum computer, but this this can this can you know like a you know what a Necker ambiguous cube is you stare at it and the vertices switch you get a lot of that out of, out of that structure. Uh, again, so you can have a array of these. I don't know yet quite how to close pack this. This is key. How to close pack this? What is one least unit will cannot stand alone. It'll be like a quark. And it looks like probably this. I think this has twelve. That will be sufficient, sufficient to give the least unit its higher dimensional structure so that it can go through all the degrees of freedom. A quantum particle in a box, subject to decoherence and the uncertainty principle. The mirror image of the mirror image is causally free. That's as far as you have to go. This complex structure with all this nonsense has to just have enough brain. And you know, we saw the one. We have the the point in the box. The left over crossing, the other under crossing, it gets, each time you double it, this has a greater structure, but it's finite, you get to the top of the structure, and then you can have this process. The reason for this is Hamilton, if you look at all of the quaternions, in order, he first had a J, the algebra didn't work, he added the K, the algebra had closure. What did he sacrifice? Commutivity. With anti, with, with a system that doesn't commute, you can keep building on it, but you never, you're still stuck. So these rotations, and the, you, you get enough rotations so you can do topological moves to momentarily break the closure, have commutivity, and then cycle back and forth. Can again be full open? It has to be like a lighthouse flashing, where it oscillates. That's the whole reason for all this unbelievable nonsense, which I'm sure may appear to you that way. Um, one of the ways to start thinking about how to design this is to, to blow up a hypercube. And these go together. You may have seen the little animations, and I, I didn't put one on this, but you have the inside cube and the outside cube, and the inside becomes the outside. So then, and then usually when I show the animation, I'll, I'll do one up, x, y, or up and down, and then another left, right. But you need to have three. And I, I don't have a computer program with the skills to, to have them like be a trefoil and intertwine with each other. So you have one, the left symmetry say doing that, and the right symmetry would be doing another one, and then at some point they would they would mix. The other thing is, Elizabeth Rauscher was the one who told me about that. A superluminal Lorentz boost, a spatial dimension becomes a temporal dimension. I boost it again, it's an energy dimension, that's my de Broglie bohm control factor of the unified field. Um, this came from Penrose. You can see you can make these into hyper, double hypercubes, and you can see there's it has a wave particle duality hidden into this, so you can you can begin to see how to try to develop this um, this topology. Um, this is Peter's famous space anti-space, a normal quaternion point, zero waving across to the anti-space, virtually virtual particles or Planck time oscillating back and forth. Uh, starting here at a regular a standard standard model point, then you get the chirality and then you go towards P. So that's kind of our starting point beyond the standard models to take Peter's work. Another view of this, if you look at this part, these vertices switch because the foreground becomes the front ground. There's no the three known forces are phenomenological. They're mediated by a quantum force, quantum force like the photon and electromagnetism, unified field mechanics. It's ontological, an energyless transformation of, in, of energy from brain to brain. That, that's very important. But so if you're just bringing the front backwards to the rear vertex, you use this. But if you're if you're taking it down dimension, you're going to get something like this. Again, the R three. 
blocked by the uncertainty principle in the complex space, first level of overcrossings. Um, Peter had always told me not to bother with octonians because they, they weren't necessary. The other beautiful thing that Peter taught me was that you can do anything with mathematics, anything at all. Design of math mathematics has that ability. But the quaternion algebra is, has the properties that it's suggestive of what reality is. It's like, it's like, it's like God's gift to, to mathematicians of an algebra that actually describes reality all by itself. So then, so for a while I ignored the quart octonians. Then I began to become curious when I saw that the octonians swallowed uh, the quaternions. So then I started playing with the dualities there. And then the thing that really got me going was when I found the final snowflake. So you have this, this standard one, and they can involute. You know, I need to involute, involute, involute things downward and then upward and every kind of topological move you can have. The Thanos snowflake has the ability to transform into this. And so, with the quaternions, you have left-right symmetries, spiral symmetries. But when you add the octonions, you have many more degrees of freedom for the high, highest level uh, to do this. And so, as you may know, the quart octonians sacrificed uh, associativity. So I said, well, what kind of a problem is that? But basically, the quaternions bear most of the work. All the octonians have to do is direct, which direct something. So you can you can do that with a substitutivity. And so, in a sense, you have all the all the pieces. Um, I then the hottest topic in all of physics is topological phase. I went to two work workshops and a summer school in Singapore this summer. Next year, Princeton, one of the leaders of the world of our world of science, is having a year of topological phase. This is a standard Feynman diagram for a neutrino or a um, around a fermion. And if you take, it's being generalized, not just for neutrinos and Dirac uh, particles, but being generalized as a general principle now. So you can begin to get more degrees of freedom for that. And then I try to take it one ex extra step. It's applied to uh, two-dimensional uh, quantum Hall uh, carbon, what's the carbon? The um, graphene. And it's the it's the hottest one, of the, it's the major arena for quantum computing because you get a topologically protect. The last big problem with quantum computing is decoherence. So, uh, anion quantum Hall graphene effects have a, that topologically protected state, but they can't access it in four space in the standard model. So, if you add my uh, unified field mechanics model, you'll be able to have, this doesn't have all the degrees of freedom, but because you have this additional copy of these extra degrees of freedom, you'll be able to use that, but the Andean quantum computer will be cryogenic and room size and costs 30, 40 millions of dollars. My model, because by simple NMR resonance, it's tabletop and low energy, can be used, uh, so it'll end up they may build a, one of these big quantum computers first, if they ever figure this out, and they may. I keep watching the literature, and they're so close I can't believe they haven't broken through. But it, it, you're, you're limited if you use the standard model, and so it's much so easy in, in, uh, with the extra degrees of freedom. Um, but we're that close to getting a quantum computer. Somebody's going to do my, there's only one experiment and I've had help designing it, whether I do it or kick the bucket and somebody else does it. That's how it's going to happen. There's no other choice. Lou started to hint at some of these. You see, I just I put this to show you some of the, th the ways of, of some of these topological moves can occur. 
And in, in this sense, they're showing more of a re reduction in dimensionality. Um, but I, I just wanted to show you that this, pretty much loose talk was much better than this drop that I just put in this. Uh, a repeat of the snowflake thing as a reminder. And this shows you, somebody did a, quite a big deal of these types of moves for the Joan, Jones polynomial. Kovanov's work on the categorization of the Jones polynomial. So, unfortunately, it's going to take something like this. But it, it will all, because of the symmetry, it will all fit together. And uh, anyway, I wanted to give you a taste of uh, where we're going. You can't. You can't say any of this in one hour, you know, even if I chose the least unit or any one of the things. So I, I wanted to give you an overview of the whole uh, whole thing, and I hope uh, I hope it was of some minimal value. I don't know where I'm supposed to end. If it's time for a Lino, question from Lino. Richard? Well, okay, if you want to questions. Yes, yeah, I can do it. I can do it just as well from over here. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, the point is uh, uh, about uh, transcendence. Yes. I think it's a serious point. So uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't, want, don't want to give the impression that I am dismissive. I think it's a serious point. But uh, uh, in order to, to, to explain my argument, I shall make reference to the uh, Riemann hypersphere. hypersphere. Uh, well, uh, uh, because I, I think it's, uh, you bring uh, transcendence in just uh, 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 saying God's gift to mathematician's mind or God's design uh, and you stop there. I think that transcendence uh, of transcendence, in my understanding of it, can be analyzed just as the cosmological uh, universe. Why? For instance, I take uh, Riemann's sphere was used uh, uh, by cosmologists, uh, if, as far as I know, to model uh, the background radiation. So it has become uh, a, a scientifically uh, used, contemporary, uh, contemporary scientifically used model of the universe. But uh, there is a, a, a Stanford mathematician who died 84 some years ago, Robert Tossenman, that uh, as uh, he wrote a history of mass and the book is called Poetry of the Universe. There he shows that uh, Dante's in intuition of, uh, 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 in Dante's cosmology, uh, there is the cosmos, uh, like a Ptolemaic system, and then there is another sphere which is uh, uh, in graphic representation of Dante's universe people don't know how to handle, which is called the uh, uh, Imperius. So, Osterman's intuition is that Imperius as is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, other sphere conflating into the Riemann's hypersphere model. Yeah. So, uh, I take the Riemann hypersphere model as being a model uh, to analyze the interaction between the observed and the observer. And it says, uh, it says a lot about transcendence. So, yeah. so, so that, that, that's uh, my point. And, uh, well, you may say, but well, there is an ultimate uh, transcendent. Well, that's, that's another issue. We have Plato was the first. We have Plato's cave where you're chained to this virtual reality. You, you turn, that's towards transcendence. But the more important one, Plato cost, talk, said, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much your depth of wisdom, a noetic insight was from the cosmos. cosmos. So if this is an anthropic multiverse, we can expect whether you want to give it some godlike thing or you just want to say it's part of the unified field. It doesn't make any difference to me. It's still transcendence is the final tool of epistemology, and you can use it as a tool in scientific theory formation. That's simple. 
And the Riemann sphere is very important to it. I also wrote a paper with Vigier on the uh, symmetry of absorption and emission for cosmic microwave background radiation and redshift as, as an ordered part of the background. Uh, so that to conclude, my point is how much is there of uh, 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 an objective structure of reality and how much is the, uh, uh, stru the uh, structure of mathematical thinking which makes sense of yeah, what? Well, so far we don't have access to it. We need third regime physics to have access to it. Then, right now, it's a theory, abstract, but we will soon have experimental access to it. My, in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> Do I end with one or is that my pass? Yeah, we're going to end with one. Okay. Any, any further one? questions or comments? Did, I really like the diagrams. Did you, did you draw them all? Or Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I steal and pitch and patch and cut. You know. But well, yesterday I was having a conversation with Lou. We were talking about the drawing of diagrams and how diagrams are presented. And he was talking about uh, the Euclid, um, the Euclid ge geometrical diagrams, and the fact that when you actually see it on the page, mm -hmm. it, it just kind of got some lots, lots of lines, and, you know, yeah. things. And you think, well, how did it get there? What was going through his head when he was yeah. doing it? And and I had that feeling with yours. I thought what I really would like to see is actually your drawing of those diagrams and to see what, was that, what the sense was in the way the symbols were connected because it didn't really come through in just presenting them yeah. it, 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 as a sort of as a, as a straight figure. And there was hardly any commentary on the figures, I apologize for that. Yeah, but, but it would be really good because, you, because we, we've got technology now. You can animate the drawing of these things. You know, just, yeah. get, a, just get a tablet or something and just, yeah. or even video yourself drawing it. And that actually talk through what those different the different parts of it are and explain how they're connected. Yeah. Because that, that I think the clear I can do that with some, but some the, the process is lost because yeah. after you know the computer's cluttered. So when I get to the final one, a lot of times they erase. Yeah. But, but this stuff clearly means something to you. Oh, um, yeah. Well, and yeah. and 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 the, the the more that we can do to actually convey the meaning. Well, but if you take the, 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 the hexagon, and the, the, the also perceptually, you can interpret a, a, as a double 3D cube. Mm. You just focus on that idea, and you, you see them. Uh, I, I get, I get it, a, phys a professional physicist mathematicians, only about 20% appreciate the conceptual diagrams, the rest want to see the equation. But and if, on a final note, you see a paper from CERN with 25 authors. I invite any of you to help do this third regime experiment. If you want to be part of it, just come and join in. You know, this is in our lifetime. This, this, is, this hasn't been a paradigm shift for 100 years. This is it for us. So let's have some fun with it. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Let's thank Richard and all. <laughs>